It's a beautiful day. Lucky that we live Hawaii. 24-7, 365. Swimming in the ocean anytime. Take a leap. Aloha kako, and welcome to another episode for Foundations of Healthy Generations, a program for and about public health in Hawaii. I'm your host, Lori Lynn Salamanca, from the WIC Services Branch. We invite you every month to join us in our episodes in highlighting public health programs, initiatives, and concerns. Today, we have our, for our guest, we have Mr. Peter Whitaker, who comes from the SCD, um, sorry, SCD HIV? Prevention, SDAs. Mm -hmm. SDA AIDS Prevention um, Branch. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Laura. Um, now, the, the the branch is a part of uh, the Communi Communicable Diseases Div Division, correct? That's right, yeah. In fact, it's now expanded Communicable Disease and Public Health Nursing Division. Yeah. Okay. I would I'd love to hear more about how you got started in public health and your history with the department as well. Yeah, it's a circuitous uh, path. I, I didn't uh, grow up always wanting to be in public health. In fact, my real interest in life is in um, uh, um, so social justice. And my, my background initially was in education and I had the opportunity to work in Indonesia in a program that was orienting doctors and rural teachers to do public health, to actually learn the skills that were useful to them in a rural village. So these were not the skills of a modern hospital. They were the skills of clean drinking water, immunization, uh, nutrition for children. So that was my initial orientation to public health. So moved from education into public health. And I enjoyed it so much. And living in a third world country, I could see what a great difference it made relatively simple interventions in people's lives that they could actually in many cases take care of themselves made a big difference in their lives. That sounds like a great experience, great background that, and especially in those countries where maybe resources might be limited? Absolutely, resources are limited and on a day-to-day -day basis people have to make choices in their lives whether they're going to eat, whether they're going to invest in transportation, their kids education, clothing, housing. And what I soon found is that when people don't have good health, particularly in third world countries, but certainly true in Hawaii and other countries as well, that really means our lives are not working very well. Good health is really the foundation of a good lifestyle and a, and a happy life. Yeah, well, I think it's, I find this very intriguing, I mean, your travels, um, because having all those different experiences, you know, gives all those different perspectives to come to Hawaii. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how long you were uh, abroad and the various countries that you visited? Yeah, I, I was very lucky. So I lived in Indonesia for 10 years, five years in central Java and five years in Bali. I was in Nepal and then I worked with the global AIDS program in the Congo, in Brazzaville, the Congo, and then in Zimbabwe and, and then uh, Mauritius. Um, that's pretty much over a period of uh, about 15 years. And in uh, the last, say, 10 years of my career, I've been doing volunteer work in India and um, uh, Ethiopia, and uh, most recently in Botswana. So each one of those countries, very separate culture, very mm -hmm. different living conditions, but often very, very similar situation where you have um, an emerging public health workforce where there really is not a lot of support in education but a great deal of education, a lot of real commitment to making people's lives together. So the, the program that I've been working on was particularly interesting because it was seen in people in developing countries as Westerners sharing information with people in those countries. And what I always found is I think I, I learned more tha than I was actually teaching. And it was really that kind of sharing experience and being able to bring it back to Hawaii, I think helped uh, enrich in my experience of um, what, what public health really means in this country as well. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and then I'm interested about, because um, I think it's very relevant, you know, your work, and you said it was uh, 
in Botswana. That's correct, yeah. Uh, with, with HIV and AIDS. Um, what do you think the difference, you know, the scope or the, the, the devastation, um, the gravity between there and here? Uh, where, are there similarities? What might the differences be? Well, there are similarities. Overall in the world, there's um, between 35 and 40 million people that are currently infected with HIV. In the United States, about 1.1 million. So the, uh, the gravity of the situation, it, it certainly varies from country to country. We are also a resource-rich country. We really do have the potential for taking care of people that have HIV, diagnosing them, providing support, providing medication. But you know, in this country, there are minority populations. There are populations that are disproportionately impacted by HIV that do not have access to that public health support that we take for granted in this country. And in many ways, it makes our situation quite similar to, to other countries. One of the classic examples, I think, is um, our, na our nation's capital, uh, DC. Such a high percentage of young African Americans who are infected with HIV, it's very similar in rates to some countries in Africa. Certainly not something we can take any pride in, but certainly something that we can learn from, that within our own societies, within this Im immensely rich country that we live in, there are people that do not have those equal opportunities that we, that we may take for granted in our own lives. Yeah, just because it's available doesn't mean that everyone is able to actually have access to that's it. Cor that's correct, yeah. yeah. Availability yeah. and access being the, being the change, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, um, so we kind of did a, a, a kind of a similarity and difference between different countries. What about time-wise? What are changes, the changes that we've seen in the U.S. or in Hawaii about how HIV and AIDS are, are being approached? Uh, uh, I, that's a really interesting question, too. I started about 20 years ago in the Department of Health, as you said, as the branch chief. And in the United States, those were still the, the dark old days of HIV. Um, uh, I have some posters in my office that show you can't get HIV from a swimming pool. You can't get it in a restaurant. You can't get it playing hide and seek with other children. You can't get it shaking hands. So we've come a long way in 20 years. And in 1994, I think, is what marked the, the real divide. In 1994, we started having medications that allow us to start treating HIV more effectively than ever before. And that's been one of the major changes in, in treatment. Uh, since 1994, we now have medications available that not only keep people very healthy yeah. who have HIV, but most dramatically it decreases the possibility of transmitting HIV to somebody else. So in our country, because of care, care is prevention and prevention in some ways is care. The difficulty, of course, is you have to be tested first. Yeah. If you're not tested, you don't learn that you have HIV. If you don't know you have HIV, then you don't, um, you don't seek out those care services. So, you know, one of the messages I always try to make sure that people get is that under the Affordable Care Act, testing will be a reimbursable expense. CDC recommends that everybody in this country between 14 and 65 be screened, be tested for HIV. Find out your status. Learn whether you have HIV. If you do have HIV, there's a wonderful opportunity for accessing medications that will change your life. But not only that, you will not be putting other people at risk because if you do take those medications, you're much less likely to transmit HIV to, to someone else. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's just you know, a lot of changes. I mean, with education came that piece and that stigma, that huge stigma had to be overcome so that folks would actually seek to just be tested as well. Um, and I was just, um, I thought that you know, you've had prominent figures as well, celebrities who have come out to say that, yes, I am positive. I remember that reality show, Real World, right. where um, you know MTV featured them and um, that person's life. And I think that really touched a lot of folks as well. Oh, I think you're right. It makes such a difference when it, it's, it's difficult to stigmatize a disease or a group of people when you start seeing individuals speaking about their own lives. And when you start having somebody in your own family 
or somebody in your community, in your extended family that has HIV, you start realizing that you're talking about your brothers and your sisters, your mothers and your fathers. You're not talking about an, ab an abstract group. So I think this has gone a long way to reducing stigma. And when people feel less stigmatized, they're more likely to seek services. And this is particularly true for the gay population in the United States who have been certainly disproportionately impacted by, by HIV. Well, I'm just glad to hear all these different changes and that folks can get the care that they need um, and, ha and the information that, that we need as right, well. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I mean, it's timely that we're doing this interview because it's December and December 1st right. is World AIDS Day. Um, and in fact, we have a news clip um, because World AIDS Day started in 1987 and we continue to recognize it um, you know, through the years. Mm -hmm. So let's take a moment and take a look at the clip about World AIDS Day. Hawaii marked World AIDS Day with a gathering in Makiki this afternoon. Dozens of people came together for a ceremony at Lutheran Church of Honolulu featuring speakers and a hula performance. The event was sponsored by Life Foundation and the Department of Health. Dr. Drew Kovac was the main speaker. He's been treating individuals with AIDS for more than 30 years. Once there a person is on treatment, it's very, very hard to infect someone else. So treatment is truly prevention. And I think the other really good news is that probably we're going to have at least a functional cure, if not an actual cure, in the next five to seven years. World AIDS Day began back in 1988. In Hawaii, there are an estimated 3,000 people living with HIV AIDS. So the news clip is a great way to uh, create public awareness. Um, I know that there are many aspects of the STD AIDS prevention branch, um, and each plays a fundamental role in its success. Can you tell us a little bit more about sexually transmitted disease as well as adult viral hepatitis? Yeah, m my branch works in uh, both a HIV, viral hepatitis, and STDs, as you said. And, you know, there's some real similarities across infectious diseases. One of the first ways that we approach infectious disease is through surveillance. And that doesn't mean uh, the NSA surveillance. <laughs> what it means is we want to know and we try to find information of who gets infected, how they get infected, where they live, what are the demographics. By knowing more about the people that are impacted by disease, it allows us to prepare prevention programs, uh, prepare different kinds of other uh, care services, and find the resources that we need to make sure those people receive the services. Based on the surveillance program, then we develop prevention services. And for STDs, um, much of these services are provided by community partners. Almost all of the services that are provided within the Department of Health, but certainly in my branch, are done in close collaboration with community partners. And that's because community partners are often more in touch or the most in touch with the communities that we're trying to serve. It's because they often hire employees or from the populations that we're trying to serve. So I really want to be, uh, give a shout out to our, our community partners for all the years that, that we've been working together. We really um, count on them. Together, we put together prevention programs. The, for, for STDs or HIV, clearly the, the best message is uh, don't get HIVs or STDs. But if you do, we want to make sure that people are tested and for young women, this is in family planning, or for, or for men or women, um, tested to see whether they do have sexually transmitted diseases because we know whether STDs or HIV, if you're tested, there are um, uh, excellent medications that are available mm -hmm. that in the case of um, STDs will, will cure, the, um, cure the disease. In HIV, there is no cure, but it'll certainly uh, help you live a, a long and healthy, healthy life. One of the aspects that we often forget about, though, are the partners uh, of people with STDs or uh, uh, people living with HIV. And that is really much of the focus of the, de of the department in collaboration with physicians in the community because it's most important that somebody who is positive, that their partners also get tested. What we do find sometimes is, for example, a young woman infected with an STD She's successfully treated in our clinic or in a, in a doctor's office, and she goes back to the partner that she had previously who was not treated. And what we see is that young woman is again reinfected by, by that original partner. This is a very important part of control of disease, is making sure that the partners learn that they may be at risk and making sure that they can be tested and then receive um, services as well. Okay, great. Yeah, treatment. 
and then this is part of the um, the expedited partner therapy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, uh, very exciting. Uh, the legislature in this last year uh, passed a bill, and the governor signed it for expedited partner therapy. And what that means is that the sexual partners um, of, of individuals who test positive, if they are unwilling or um, not able to go into a doctor's office to be treated themselves, which is certainly sometimes the case for young people, yeah. um, we can give the uh, original uh, patient a prescription or medication that they can deliver to their partners and the partners can take the medications or go to a ph pharmacy and get the uh, medications for themselves. And in this way, we hope that more partners will uh, be treated, uh, reduce the disease burden, and not reinfect their, um, their initial, pa the initial patients. So this is a, a very exciting um, new innovation in Hawaii. It's just going to be rolled out. It's going to be on the Department of Health uh, website in the next few weeks. We work closely with, uh, with ACOG and community organizations, oh, so yeah. it's a really good uh, community effort. Yeah. Now, um, I know that, you know, the branch works with, like, policy making and also with direct services, much like what the expedited partner therapy. What are some other direct services that the, the branch works with? Well, one of our most successful uh, services um, that we funded is the syringe exchange program. And Hawaii had the first uh, statewide syringe exchange program in the United States. We were national leaders, and to this day, I applaud our legislators and our public health leaders for supporting that, that uh, intervention. What it means is that we take used syringes out of circulation so they're not uh, left on the streets or in trash cans, and they are replaced with clean syringes. What this means is if there's any sharing of syringes, they are not sharing disease. This has dramatically changed the course of HIV and to some degree hepatitis C in our community because clean syringes do not transmit disease. So in Hawaii, we have a, a significantly lower rates of HIV than we might have if we did not have the syringe exchange program. So that's one very, ex very yeah. exciting um, example in Hawaii where I think we show excellent leadership. Um, other programs are, are case management. So we work with um, an organization on, a, on Oahu. It's the uh, Life Foundation, of Maui, the Maui AIDS Foundation. In each of our um, island communities, there is a strong AIDS service organization that we work with. And they really reach out into the community, help advise people living with HIV, provide prevention services and really raise awareness in their own community. There's nothing like people within a community raising the flag, talking to people around the, the, in their own community and, and increasing awareness. Right, because there might be, um, I think that some of the stigma that maybe we, we were trying to work on in the past might be for external, um, external individuals or groups having a stigma against that one person, but sometimes that one person might be having that stigma against themselves as well. And so I think case management is uh, you know, definitely very important for someone who might be going through emotionally, you know, spiritually, right. some challenges as right. well. Yeah. Well, what we found over the years that uh, at different times there's been speaker bureaus and there's nothing like a person living with HIV speaking to a group of high school students about their life, about their infection, to, to destigmatize disease. When they're talking person to person, they're talking about their lives mm -hmm. in a very open, very personal way. Often I think this is the strongest prevention message because it's people relating to people. It's not just about messages, it's about human interaction. Right. And that it can make a real difference. Yeah, there's, I mean, I think the face is definitely much more powerful than data and sometimes yes. photographs, right? Yes, yes, yeah. and, and often not a, a face uh, of, of a culture or a community that you feel comfortable with when it, it's from your own community. Sometimes that's the kind of information you can receive more more easily than if it's, it's somebody from outside that group. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to find out more about, um, so those were some direct services that, that the branch is involved with. How about the policy, state policy, or maybe even national policy that the branch has been involved with? 
Yeah, um, Hawaii is, is very involved at the national level, and that's been one of the most exciting parts of my job. I work uh, um, as a, well, I, I don't work, I am a member of an organization, the National Alliance of State and Ter Territorial AIDS Directors, and this is the AIDS director from each of the 50 states and the six territories getting together to try and influence national policies, so whether with the Congress, the White House, CDC, or our funders. And it's very important that we work together and give a unified message mm -hmm. to our legislators um, because there's so much in common uh, across the states that we work in. One of the that's things that I found most interesting is it's not big states versus small states but how we can work together and share our expertise. And I, I think this has been a very successful model in the United States where the states actually speak, uh, speak to power, speak to the, to the national government. When I'm working in third world countries, this is often um, something that's lacking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, programming and policy is often coming from above and it's being uh, translated down to the regional level, the district level, and the local level. And by the time you get down to the local level, there's often a lot of distortion about that message, and it may not be relevant to the people that are living um, at the lowest level. So through uh, working from the bottom up, from working through our counties, working through our state government, our state Department of Health, and then together working with the federal government, I think it's created a program in our country that's rooted in the reality of the epidemic at, at the local level. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you're on that board. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it's, I think it's important that we remind them that Hawaii is, is not necessarily how you perceive all states in Washington. Uh, <laughs> When, uh, you know, as we were mentioning earlier, in other states, you know, if, there, if there's not a doctor for, for two or three hundred miles, you get in the car and you can drive to the doctor, you can drive to the community health center. If you're on the big island and uh, you don't have a doctor, you need to go to Oahu. It's a, it's a, much, bigger, it's a much bigger lift. You certainly have to fly to, uh, to, get, to the, get to the doctor. Yeah. You know, and, and that's one of our concerns in Hawaii being an island state is are we going to be able to provide critical services in each of our communities? Yes. HIV is not centered in Honolulu, it's not centered in Oahu, it's spread throughout our islands almost in the uh, same proportion of the population um, on each of the islands. So it's um, important for the Department of Health and again with our community partners to maintain that full range of services in, in each area. Unfortunately, our doctors, our, our wonderful, wonderful HIV doctors, many who started 25 years ago in the initial days of the epidemic, are starting to look towards retirement. And that's one of the, one of the issues we're looking at now is how can, we, how can we carry on those services into the future? Right. Well, thank you for thinking about that and for that future planning for <laughs> sure, yeah. so that the services can be available to, and, and that folks can have access to it as well. Well, thank you so much for coming um, and giving us all this information about what the branch does, and um, and also, I guess, to to highlight that December first is World AIDS Day as well. Yeah. Um, in these last few minutes, would there be any sort of important tips that you might want to share with our audience? Well, I don't know whether it's um, it's a tip, but I think one of the slides that uh, the audience may have a chance to see was the. Uh, staff of the STD AIDS prevention branch. And I am, I'm the branch chief, but the work gets done by the branch staff and I really want to give a, a, you know, a real acknowledgement to people who dedicate their lives on a day-to-day -day basis for providing services, uh, often in, under difficult conditions. So um, to, to my colleagues in the, in the STD AIDS prevention branch and, and the rest of the Department of Health and the community, my, my sincere thanks because it really is a community effort that, that moves us forward. Oh, great. Well, thank you again, Peter, for joining us. And then to those watching today, thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for another episode of Foundations for Healthy Generations. Until next time, ahoi ho. It's a beautiful day. Lucky that we live Hawaii name. 24-7, 365. Swimming in the ocean anytime. 